Okay. I was thinking about what you said before too, and with the um, why can't something have multiple fundamental characteristics? I'm still not fully clear, but I was thinking like it has something to do with identity. Cause like, how could you have like an ant that would uh, collect things most of the time and then half the time or half the time talk in English? Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not, that would be an example of maybe multiple fundamentals, but I couldn't quite picture something that would actually work yeah. and I don't know but it's still bizarre it's still bizarre in my mind so it still feels a bit strange that there's one everything has one significant causal factor when I say that it's just I don't know there's something about it that's odd yeah I know I know what you mean but it's hard <laughs> to answer that concisely I mean that's a big question but it's also I think there's also a relationship to someone who asks what's the cause of the universe that maybe there's some relationship there i don't know um yeah, i don't know what it, it is about identity but it's hard to specify exactly why everything would come down to like one essential for a concept yeah i think unit economy is part of it but but why would it have to be that way well i think it's just the nature of integrating into a unit i think by nature of something being a unit you've already identified that there's one similarity and not multiples and or there is some primary similarity that really does unite all of them it would be hard to find an individual characteristic that fits them all uh, all the time like number of fingers on a person can can vary but the, i think the rational faculty you would say doesn't vary to any degree, mm. is mm -hmm. what I would argue. Right. Well, it does because it, you're you're talking about the the num the the measurement itself. Like the fact that someone has fingers is the characteristic, but the measurement is the number of fingers. And same with the rational yeah, I mean, faculty. You could say like, finger having or thumb having, but then you realize it captures more things than you intend, or you could say it's rational finger faculty and and thumb having, but I would think that if you could integrate them as a unit, why would you have two fundamentals? It seems like if you do integrate them into a unit that you've already implicitly selected just one similarity right. or one primary similarity that you right. focused on when you, or one primary similarity that was focused on right. was integrated. Right. That I started later getting on into like, you know, well, what is space? <laughs> like between, because I was trying to go, okay, with everything has an identity, everything has characteristics. And so why is it that an entity has one causal, one characteristic that is causally significant for all the, as many, um, many others. And it's always the case for every entity. And I was like, well, what separates entities? And then I, I went down this rabbit hole and it didn't, it didn't go so well. So yeah, space. Yeah. <laughs> that is, yeah. I don't know how to answer it at that point. Cause then that's so nitty gritty. That's really into the nature of ontology, I guess. Is that how are entities separated? Or, oh, that's a much more deeper question, like advanced yeah but i can yeah i can see how difficult those questions are to approach well and properly and um, i can see also how fundamental they may be and uh isn't that the basis for all our thinking so if you shift a fundamental concept like that you might lead to some i don't know if you're mega genius who's working in gene in physics or something and you shift a fundamental concept like that then you might lead to more discoveries right that's what you were saying about geniuses in field a while ago they usually make fundamental shifts in some concept yeah i think within objectivism though that this is a more derivative topic so i don't i think van would argue that it wouldn't fundamentally change the assumptions that mm -hmm. we made about say epistemology but right. it might change some assumptions about the way we may approach a, a derivative idea that's not going to get us to question say the law of identity or we won't even get us to question that units are integrated or that yeah, concepts are made out of units but 
yeah. it could make us make a further distinction about the nature of entities and concepts of entities yeah. in space or axiomatic concepts. Yeah. So it'd be derivative stuff, but it wouldn't change our, the basis to these questions. Why would yeah. we even ask the question? Um, on the topic of, I don't know that much about quantum physics, but I've heard um, people will sometimes use research from physics to then question co cause and effect or whether there is identity because you, you have to do probabilistic prediction on where something is. You can't, there's no, apparently there's no cause. It's just, uh, it, maybe it's here, maybe it's there. And so my question about that is, can't it be the case if we say that volition is a kind of cause and volition does, has alternatives, why can't we say the same thing about some kind of an other phenomena in the universe that the cause is the fact that it has alternatives that can't be predicted? Why, why is that, is that contradicting um, cause? I don't think that would contradict there being one fundamental, but I mean, why couldn't there be choice or some I mean, no, it could be some alternative to choice. If, we, if we're saying volition is a, is a question of alternatives, then why can't there be some physical phenomenon which also has alternatives and that itself is a cause? Like, uh, yeah. It depends what you mean. That I'm not sure how much worth is getting into it, but yeah, okay. you just made me think of how like logic gates within computer electronics that they have to actually like there is a selection in the sense that there's alternatives was determined. The selection is determined by some electric output or something like that. Right. And that would choose a selection that's not always, it's not always a given route it will take. It, will, it depends on several factors. We could say it relies mm -hmm. on antecedent factors and that would distinguish it as not free will. But, but I don't think that's really would be about different um fundamentals that's just yeah um yeah there's an antecedent factor there that determines the yeah that determines the outcome but i'm i'm thinking more if if we acknowledge that in the universe there can exist some form of causality that has alternatives or different outcomes that cannot be reduced down to an antecedent cause then why can't there be physical phenomena that have the same characteristic of multiple alternatives and without any antecedent cause to those multiple alternatives, which you can't predict. I mean, you could just say that for it to actually be volitional, I mean, it would seem like then, yes, those would be volitional things, it would seem, but maybe you would claim that volition implies all these other aspects of the brain that you can't separate free will from the physical nature of it, that you can't separate free will from the way the brain mm -hmm. functions, that right. you couldn't have a free will apart from whatever it is that makes the brain function as it does. You could claim it. Yeah, other entities could be that way, but the only ones that we know that are that way are humans. And there are people who might argue that there are fundamental particles that are volitional or that God is somehow more fundamental than anything else and that's volitional and doesn't rely on some theists argue that like oh that's proof god is real because you could have free will apart from anything physical or in the human body right. or it gets weird like that but, but yeah, in principle sure you could have anything that is volitional but you have to argue what what it's not that nothing else about volition matters that it doesn't matter these are the non-essential aspects like you can't have free will with about all the other things you were referring to, like the brain operations and all that. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I'm even sweeping aside volition and I'm saying that, right. okay, there's a, there's something in the universe called volition, which can choose and there's no necessity. It's all contingent. Uh, uh, well, there's a necessity in the fact that it's nature is to choose. And so that's yeah. the necessity and that's the cause. And we have no issue with that. We're like, okay, that's cool. There's a, there's this physical thing in the universe that can choose between alternatives and that's a kind of yeah. cause. So if we're saying that, why can't there be some subatomic particle 
that it doesn't, it's not volition. It's some other phenomena. Let's call it, uh, let's call it, um, let's call it, I don't know, randomness or let, I, maybe that's not a good word because it's obviously used elsewhere, but let's just call it a magic particle. And this magic particle does, it will sometimes do act this way and sometimes act that way. And that's in its nature. If we have no problem saying that about volition, that it's in volition's nature to choose between multiple choices and it can't be, it can't, there's no antecedent cause to that choice. It's in the nature of the entity, the thing, okay. then why can't we say it's in the nature of this magic particle to just um, act in, in different ways, like multiple alternatives that we can't, that we can't predict just as we can't predict volition. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't even have to be a volition. It could be just a phenomenon that can act in multiple different ways that can't be predicted. And that's in its nature. That's what I was thinking about. Cause like if we, cause then maybe there is no issue in the quantum physics things, but I don't know what implications that has on everything else. So yeah, I, I would just answer just, I, I really don't want to get into it cause it, it's <laughs> okay. really off topic from, <laughs> yeah. but I would say yes. It's, yeah. it's fine to think that way. I don't see any error yeah. in that kind of question. It's just, how do you apply it? But yeah, there could be some things that are way more random seeming than anything else that it seems like. There's nothing you could be integrated on. It's only quantum physics can help understand those things because those things only seem to occur at the quantum level. Right. They don't seem to occur at any other level. So it would be relevant for that. <clears throat> but in yeah, day-to-day okay. life, I don't think it has it's any application. It's just yeah. philosophy of physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. applies to physics. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. What other, let's continue these random questions. Ah. Uh, a pattern, uh, I was wondering if you've thought about this at all, but a pattern I've seen that is, I guess you could just conceptualize it, conceptualize it as shallow thinking, but I wonder if there's a, a deeper principle than just saying that, which is when people say, when they explain some human behavior as they're just idiots or he's an idiot or you're an idiot. Uh, so I'll give you some more concrete examples. So, um, one might be ask someone why the farmers don't expand overseas and they're like, Oh, they're all just idiots. And that's like the one cause, or you ask someone why um, management hasn't told them why they're moving offices. And the person will say, Oh, they're all management is just idiots. They're all idiots. Uh, these are so actually based on real examples. Or you ask someone, uh, you know, if George Bush uh, didn't think, if George Bush, um, if George Bush knew they didn't have nuclear weapons, uh, why would he invade Iraq? And someone would say, "Oh, he's an idiot." It was because he was an idiot, or they'll come up with some. There's always, I don't know if you, you know what I'm talking about. There's that pattern I've seen that a lot, where people just say, "Oh, it's because yeah. they're idiots." That's always the explanation. And so I'm wondering if there is. Are you able to? Um, like, why would people buy, buy that product? Oh, they're all idiots. I've heard that so many times in different things. And so is there a deeper principle other than me just saying that's shallow thinking? Would you, because I've seen it so much. So the way I would think about it is, well, first think about what kind of, um, like identify what they're responding to. I mean, they're responding to something. What's in common about those? examples it's say a consequence they didn't like they didn't they didn't like what occurred or it went against their interest in some way yeah it doesn't whether they it was because they disliked it or it violated their moral principles or whatever them angry. Some reason, yeah. they it's they think it's wrong yeah and and they're attempting to explain the behavior or explain the consequence or saying oh it's a result of the idiocy of these people it could be it, when we're looking at human behavior, which they're trying to explain, or at least consequences blaming humans, human behavior on it. We have to first consider even, well, uh, among all these things are, are they in fact human caused? I mean, we can say that management, um, not telling you they're moving. I mean, um, that could be a matter of I mean, maybe they willfully didn't do it. 
or maybe what other reasons could there be maybe that they couldn't get the information to everybody else or they didn't tell anybody in time or the email system went down and for some reason didn't get out the email didn't get out the day before they really did tell you I mean, they're trying to say that identify something the pattern seems to follow that uh, they want to blame a person for what went wrong yeah. which sometimes it might be true but you could consider do they have an actual reason to blame a person it would be shallow thinking i guess depending on to what extent are they really engaging the possible reasons this might occur so is it is the principle if i'm looking for the abstraction in the concrete because i've seen people say that a lot would you say it's abstract enough to say that's um irrationality because it's it's not it's uh it's not um well, I don't. I don't even know if irrationality is too is too broad an abstraction. Probably, it's it's a sign of refusal to think because how can you cut? Like, it's just such a weird. It, it is such a conclusion to come to. It's like you're just cursing someone rather than trying to identify or say I don't know why. Yeah. Um, so I I don't know. I'm just wondering. Yeah, thoughts on the abstraction in the concrete in that well, case. I, I agree with jump. what you're saying. There's multiple causes potentially. I wouldn't that, jump uh, to not, the irrationality part until I would know how to distinguish between whether the judgment's good or bad or whether the judgment is rational or not. Could there be cases where people were just idiots and that's why? I don't see why not. I think often that is more often the case than some malicious intent. Idiot is but pretty loose term though. It just means, yeah. it literally means someone's like can't function because they can't think. So it's, yeah. It's too loose. Yeah, I think that could be part of it that, like, even if you want to engage, is it a rational belief or not? Are they being precise or are they just being just some vague word as a yeah. reaction to things I don't like? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is the case that, like, if you think about what you're trying to integrate here, a description of a causal description of why an event happened, they are blaming a person or they, they're ascribing the reason it happened to a person and they're not really thinking further than um, the initial reaction because it doesn't seem there's anything else to it. And if they could define their terms, then you might say, oh, I'm my bad. You, you actually aren't an idiot coming or you're not, you're actually coming to a rational conclusion, but probably more often than not that they're blaming somebody. I mean, just by finding out you would talk to them that's the only way to be sure, I think. But, but by seeing that pattern, though, I think it's you could at least identify that as a reaction to consequences they don't like, or that are against their, yeah. their view of life. Agree. And Ma yeah, maybe the um, I just wrote this now. Maybe the principle, the abstraction in the concrete is to conclude their concrete bound because that's just an emotional association. Oh, someone did something bad. I didn't like, they could have done it a better way. I think therefore they are stupid. That's like just very emotional. You know, when you do something wrong in school, someone tells you you're an idiot. It's like concrete bound associations. Maybe that's that would be one way. I mean, concrete bound would end up that way. I could see but yeah. that's one possible explanation of the pattern. I mean, just as a pattern, we just, what I first do is just identify what, what is the pattern anyway. Let's say what that pattern is. Let's identify it explicitly, not just, oh, here's three examples. Why do people think that way? Well, we first have to integrate it into like, what is the form of this example? Like, how would you abstract away the details? You would say, you would have to first identify like the different parts of it. Like there's there's a consequence, like somebody's judging why, like George Bush did why, they don't like that. And, or you could say like, you're identifying that as a description of behavior as everybody's an idiot. So you could generalize that way and then try to find what's in common among those examples. And that would be the best way to go about doing it. In, in all cases, there's an anger 
that's the emotional evaluation. And then there's two people involved at least. Yeah. And someone is evaluating the other person as having done something. Well, I mean, if it's anger at the evaluation is in, an injustice, they could have, they had some standards. So someone's committed some injustice, not necessarily against them, I guess, but yeah. against what they think is right, which is yeah. strange. Cause that isn't that if it doesn't affect you, then I, I don't know why you get angry, but uh, just a perceived injustice. Yeah. Perceived okay. that and I'll just, Right. You shouldn't be that way. That's why they're angry. Right, right, right. Idiots, therefore, I'm mad. Something like that. So, that's um, yeah, I mean, that's only, it's there's some injustice, perceived injustice committed, and they don't like it. And so the conclusion is the person is an idiot. Is an idiot. That, that's the only thing I can see in common. The person lacks ability to handle abstract concepts. I don't, they're not even thinking on that level. They're not, it's just idiot, bad word, someone bad, someone committed injustice, therefore idiot, but not, not evil, just really bad because they're incompetent. That's, that's the, it's just, to me, I, I, now that I, I think about it, the only thing I can think of that would be a principle in the, con in the examples is the concrete boundness. Yeah, there is analysis in social psychology about that sort of thing that you don't, they just, they more than blame, oh, it was a mistake. When people see something wrong done, they tend, at least in America and people of our age range, they tend to um, label the person as evil or in some way immoral or some way really judgmental and negative. Like it wasn't right. just that they made a mistake, but they're an idiot. Like they're trying to attribute more wrong to the person to explain right. this behavior or to explain this consequence. Right. So it okay. is a bit simplistic thinking. We could come up with examples where it is a rational statement to say they're idiots. We had to ask, well, is there any evidence? And you probably quickly find out that there is none. Then you could start going on like, oh, what are they thinking about then? Well, they're either thinking about the other person or they're thinking about themselves or both. So you can say either blaming the other people or they're blaming themselves or there's many ways you go about doing it but you'd be right to say that it's more like concrete bound because it's more the immediate reaction. Like me, no, like me, angry, me smash. And that's <laughs> kind of what it often turns out being. Yeah. Okay. A anyway, well, the, the, say the, they're, yeah, sorry, go. You could say they're operating on maybe moral intuition that their feeling of outrage justifies their moral judgment. Right. Yeah. I was trying to find, the, I wasn't sure if I was looking at it correctly in terms of like looking for the abs thinking in principles. So that's why yeah. I was motivated by that. Um, have you read My 30 Years with Ayn Rand by the speech by Lena Peikoff? No. Okay. I have not read it. And well, if I asked you, why would you say thinking in essentials is important? what would your answer, like, how does it help you? What, what, what would your answer be? If you have to I like faster, briefly explain to someone. I think faster with them. I can navigate problems quicker. I could identify um, questions quicker and answers quicker. If I could identify yeah, okay. the question fast, I usually can sort through the information to find what I need. It helps creative thought to the extent that I'm not constantly swimming in confusion or just it feels like I can make connections easier if I have good concepts and essentials I can jump from one to the next pretty yep. quickly because the essentials remind me of the other ones okay and just that makes sense like efficiency and thinking efficiency that's what I really yep. notice speed and thinking even though I'm not necessarily calculating things better like I really don't think I'm good at math but I can think about math if I use the concepts right then I can sort of do it like if I think conceptually enough that I can retain things effectively, even if I'm not like a speed demon at math or at arithmetic, I can still um, think conceptually and that can help me do the heavy conceptual work on yeah. other stuff. 
Okay, cool. That was, that was a good, uh, yeah, so efficiency. I would now add to that maybe efficacy too, because if you're getting caught up in a concept and you're looking at all the wrong characteristics, you're gonna, you're not, you're not gonna get to any end goal necessarily. So, okay. Um, questions. Oh, I was thinking about, you replied to me about the art and like how it makes you, and I was also thinking about what you said, how it makes you rethink a concept. And because it, it triggers your interest by triggering your sense of life or whatever. And it makes you, and it makes you see some abstraction from a new perspective, potentially and question what is and isn't essential about that abstraction, what characteristics are or are not important. Like I gave the example of rock, how like you might come and, have this view of independence and you think, oh, independence, and you associate that kind of like, oh, emo in the street or someone who dresses really funky. But obviously that's not, <clears throat> when you read uh, The Fountainhead, you might go, hang on a second, is that really an important characteristic? Is that completely irrelevant? You might end up throwing it aside because of that. So remember we're talking about that. Yeah. And I found something, I think this kind of reinforces it. What if, this is what literature can do. So what if suddenly I describe Hank Reardon as, you know, his life is like, uh, or I describe what, what he's going through as the pendulum of his innocuous existence swung between his, the office of his home, the office and his home with uniform monotony. Yeah, it's a good metaphor. And suddenly I'm, but I'm looking at his, his work from a new perspective of it being, I will send you, I'll put it in the chat because I, I don't know if it's easy. Yeah. It was the pendulum on, of his innocuous existence swung between the office and his home with uniform monotony. And so suddenly it, it, you're looking at work in, in a completely different way than say we would when reading Atlas Shrug and Hank Reardon, it like becomes this kind of pointless, dull, like that would be, the essential so that's what literature is doing right it's suddenly making you look at these things in like oh that's that's such a i hate work work between work and the office i'm like a pendulum swinging between work and office in in this uniform monotony and if that resonated with you then you're suddenly questioning you're suddenly questioning what is the significance of work right yeah or you you're struck that well i don't know when i see that i think uh I was struck by like that's boring, like that's what I'm struck with. That feeling yeah, that boredom boring. is like it's terrible. Like, what does it mean to do this? Why does it strike me this way? Or yeah, now I'm finding myself thinking like, wow, that's boring. Why would someone do this? Isn't that draining? Or I could even just empathize with the sense that like it's soul draining work that you feel like you're drained of purpose and. So it really gets me to consider things in a, a different light, just just by that reaction. Like the wow. reaction like came first. It like this is saying something to me about life. But once I've not are noticing this reaction, then I could analyze it in many ways. I could start thinking about, oh, what's my feeling when I do this? Or I could think about more uh, analytical, like, oh, what is work? Or you could do something more like uh, in ethics, like, oh, what does it mean to do just drift through life? Or even just that association right. with boredom, it makes you feel like a sense of boredom in the character and it makes you think a certain way. It's just so a there's, natural result. There's two aspects. So the first is you, you might have like an emotional reaction which you can analyze your own values from. And then then question whether or not the the thing being uh the the underlying idea is true or like it is an essential characteristic for example because you could describe hank reardon as a pendulum swinging between the office and his home with uniform monotony but clearly like there's way more than that but this let's say this author would paint it that way and uh, they would yeah. look at it from that perspective. They would go, oh, there's this guy and he's just pouring. All he does is just pour iron ore and he's like between the office and his home and that's his monotonous existence. Like someone could look at it that way. And then, then it's, so you may emotionally react to that and then you get to 
analyze that and then you get to analyze is this a uh, essential or non-essential of the concept of work that's that's the idea that you were trying to convey right now I've captured yeah yeah okay. yeah that if you want to think more about it art can give you a vehicle to do that but you could just read the artwork just for the experience of it that yeah. the emotional reactions you get and just follow that and then think about it later it doesn't have to be that you're doing you only read art for that reason you could right. just go through it because of this feeling and feel you get but then you could do this more analytical thing after the fact which would be like literary analysis but you don't have to analyze it always it really could just be this artistic experience and that's all you need sometimes yeah yeah okay cool I, i'm getting it uh it's uh, more clear to me now so that's that was good uh, remember I asked about at what point is something X and we ended up talking about, okay, so it's all contextual How, like it depends on your standard and the standard determines um, what, you know, when or not some, you can describe something as good, bad, evil, whatever it is you want. And I was thinking about it because it even comes up in like, you know, like you can talk to yourself and say, oh, it's been a bad day, but to even determine that you'd need some kind of like, you need some kind of standard. And even if you have, let, let's say you want to judge yourself, like, have I been good or bad today? Like by an objective standard of morality, like even then it's not easy. Like even if you're judging yourself and you're a witness to your own actions and thoughts all day, and you've got a list of all these things that are considered virtues, like it's not, it's not, I, I, I still, it still wouldn't be clear to me how you'd go, oh, well, today I was evil. Today I was good. Um, how you add up all those little things throughout the day and determine what is the most, how you weigh them. Like even with an objective morality, I would have no idea how to weigh different um, actions. I think in the, in the thread, David talked about weight based on, all, you know, reasonable alternatives, but in the case of observing yourself, that's not applicable because you know exactly what your motivation was and action. Yeah. I don't know if you've got thoughts on that, but like, my point is like the whole reason at getting one of the motivating reasons at getting at that question was like, it comes up so often and you're like, it will affect the way you talk to yourself. Cause you're like, is it a bad day? Was I, did I do well? Or did I do bad? Like those summarized or summary evaluations do seem to matter. Um, but they're not easy to, they're almost, I can't even think of a way to do that objectively. Um, I always value the purpose of, identifying yourself as good or evil <clears throat> other than yeah you can identify them as you go i mean i guess the question would be would you evade them when you do it like would you actually bother to tell yourself honestly that you did something wrong and you would fix it it wouldn't even be so important to say you're evil because you know you can decide to change it and when you decide to change and focus on changing it you want to say oh you're evil forever now because you did that one evil act, now you're forever evil. The difference with judging other people is that you can decide right now to change. You can say, I want to change now. With other people, they might not want to. So you right. can say in their current state that they're evil, but then it might change right, right. if they say, I'm going to change, or they recognize it and decide as soon as these consequences bear themselves out, I'm going to fix everything up as best I can. Because sometimes right. you might have done something bad and you can't undo the consequences and they're happening now and you can't undo it. But then right. you could either maybe pay back for it or you could acknowledge the wrongdoing and you can fix it. It's more a matter of, I think acknowledging it when you do something wrong, even not just waiting when I try to reevaluate your day to see if you, a list of bad things you did. Um, I think usually you could deal with them when they happen. Like if you've ever had an argument with somebody, I think, well, I've been able to like even realize in my head, like, oh, I see you like, I got to think about like 10 minutes ago, I see there's some things I did wrong. I'll maybe apologize later, but I recognize what I've done and I will change that behavior in the future as best I can. And being a moral person, I would want to find the ways I prevent that from happening again. And that's yeah, that the makes sense. Say, like, like, I'm good because I know I'm trying to right these wrongs. And right. 
I, I'm identifying what I did wrong, focusing right. on it and identifying it and then acting against it in order to fix it. Yeah, I guess the it's interesting because then it does open up the question, is that even a productive way to think about yourself, like to make these kind of global evaluations on what basis? And then uh, it also makes me think of, um, I, if you're really precise about what you mean when you say uh, someone is bad or someone is good, then you're not necessarily going to, you're going to, if you think about that correctly, you'll think about yourself correctly too. It would mean, it would have to mean that. Or if you think about yourself correctly, you might think about others correctly. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I can see how you could may, maybe one, one. So one other thing is my error here, or one possible error is I'm again, thinking in this kind of omniscient sense, because, uh, you know, you could have someone who's done something bad and you call them evil, but now they're redeeming themselves, but you don't have the evidence or the means to get the evidence for that. So you still consider them evil, but it's objective. It's just that they're not evil, but in the con in your context of knowledge and given the objective facts, they are evil, if that makes sense. So you could have that. Yeah, given, happen. given all known things, given all things that are known about them, you yeah. judge them as that way. But you always know about yourself more. And you yeah. can always know if you choose to be good. So it's relatively pointless to say if you're good or evil. You just acknowledge yeah. if you did something wrong or not. You could say the action was bad or evil or wrong. But I don't think it translates to saying you are bad. Yeah, maybe maybe it's in the it's in the actual sentence, as in like when you say someone is something, it doesn't mean that's the totality of them. So like it doesn't make sense to say when I say I am bad or it doesn't mean I'm fundamentally like, there's no fundamentally evil. I may mean I could, it could be used in different senses maybe. So maybe when I say I am evil or someone else is evil, I say they've done something that's not redeemable like Hitler, for example, right? Like yeah. how does he redeem what he's done? Um, yeah. But so maybe, maybe part of the issue is that the, the, the whole way of the whole thing of saying, someone is evil, someone is good, I'm bad, or I'm good, has different meanings. Do you think that makes sense? Yeah, I think evil is usually in use in the irredeemable way. Yeah. Okay. That you, there's nothing you can do, even after you've done it and acknowledge it. Even. Maybe yeah. That there's nothing to right. do. Or maybe you could say that there's some redeeming factor about them, at least. Despite their evil, they've done at least one thing good. But... Well, there's so much to consider about a person that usually you just say within given what I know about them, there's they've been mostly bad, mostly good, or they have a tendency to lie or whatever it might be. You could identify those things and then judge how that impacts your life, whether it helps you flourish or not. Would you say that um, it makes sense to say that like you could say that that person is evil for me, but not evil for you, not in the subjective sense, in the sense that given an objective morality, this person offers some, like he's got a lot of bad traits um, that, are, that are evaluated against the subjective morality, but he offers me personally some value still, like if I keep him at arm's length, whereas for you, there's no value. So for you, he's evil, for me, he's good. Does um, that make sense? I would just hesitate to say evil in that case, then I went. I might yeah, okay. say incompatible or bad for you or I mean, in some ways, some personalities just don't really get along and it would be wrong to interact with them or that maybe somebody's really has a really bad temper and terrible at controlling it, but you know how to interact with that. So it's not as bad for you yeah. as bad as it might be for somebody else. Like some people can handle it, some people can't. It doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that person's as a totality evil, but there's certain extents of um, vice that you can handle. Like yeah. I can maybe handle um, narcissism better than another person. Yeah. Like I know how to handle that a bit, a little bit without losing my sense of self, but other people can't do it at all. Like it'll destroy them. Like I barely can handle, but at least I can get by or might compare it like i'm really bad at handling 
people that are, um, can't think of a good example, that are pretentious, I guess. And like, I just, I think it's a vice, but I can kind of deal with it, but there are people that can deal with it better than me. But I think in either case, it's like, overall, they're not good. Like, they're not like, oh, these people make you flourish. But, but there's some limit to what value they can provide. Does that make and sense? And so, yeah, it does. And then, so it goes back to when you're making a moral evaluation, there's no such thing as, so is there such a thing as, I guess, I guess then the only thing, the only, because this is this is used differently in in the text. Like you'll say someone irrational is evil, but like the question is, can you say someone is evil <laughs> only when they've done an irredeemable deed or not? And the rest of the time is like this person is good for me, this person is bad for me. Like that's what I'm yeah, I, trying to get my head around. I would just say Brandon Peacock use the word too often. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's just my like they use the yeah. word way too much. Yeah. It's like Rand's yeah, okay. favorite word is evil. Like of yeah. all the words, evil is her favorite word. <laughs> like I've seen it. Okay. So, well, I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but yeah. But I think the important principle here is just that you have to judge it based on how it impacts one's life or lives in general. Yeah. Okay. I think one thing that if something negatively impacts your life, it probably impact negatively impacts everybody's life. Right. But it might not as negatively impact Right. everybody like right. i can maybe deal with a liar better than someone else and but in neither case is it good it's good but yeah i might be able to get more benefit out of the interaction but it's nothing in comparison to say somebody is like as every characteristic you could want in a friend and just bearing personality i mean then you might not say like oh it's just maybe you get along better with them than others in the same way that you're not friends with everyone some people are better friends with you than others. And you could almost say that some people are worse people to you than others. And you could just deal with them differently. Going, going back to what the example you gave of pretend, pretend, pretentious people, I guess um, that would, so actually now that I think about it, if you want to say someone is evil or good, if you want to say that, use that language, then it would just be a matter of are they characteristically acting in a way that is um at odds with an objective morality that you've uh, that you're yes. evaluating them against and yes. so someone pretentious for example isn't it might be a minor part of their character and it's for yeah. you it's annoying but it's not it's overall it's not a significant it's not a significant aspect of their personality so i can and then even about yourself actually that's what it is if you say someone is good or evil you're just talking about has their characteristic mode of operating been one that is at odds with an objective morality? And so it says causally significant, like, um, although it's tricky because obviously with a murderer, like, I don't know, I don't know how that works, but um, yeah. Yeah. But the general principle, I think you got, yeah, yeah it really depends on the context and uh, the way they, in, the way they follow whether the characteristic you follow an objective morality. And then you could judge which degree it is harmful because you could have had a friend that has something you think is not good about them. Yeah. But it doesn't mean you think they're the worst person in the world. There might be more positive qualities yeah. or that negative quality doesn't harm you as much. But you might not say that you're the love of your life or something, but they're a person in your life nonetheless. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, but at least you could identify which friends benefit you the most, which, which friends are a, a strain on your life and which yeah. friends enhance your life. And I think that's very important to recognize. If you do recognize a lot of negatives and they're causing stress on you, then in what way is their, your life any better with them? Yeah. they might in fact be worsening your life and in that sense yeah they're bad people and it wasn't because oh they followed an objective morality and you just didn't like them or something it's like it's deeper than that even that 
they're going against what even enables you to flourish. They're not, it's worse than a stranger. Like strangers are just neutral, but somebody you could identify as going, detracting from your life. That's what you want to avoid. Even, even when I think of like characteristic mode of operating, even picking that up is not necessarily, it's actually quite difficult given how mixed people like everyone is or a lot of people, let's just say it's actually really, really hard. Anyway, I don't know. There's no, I, cause I read in OPA, there's no, there wasn't an answer to that. It was just a kind of very broad list of considerations he gave, but it, it doesn't, um, I don't know how much it helps you make those evaluations. So, yeah. Yeah. I might, I would almost say that characteristically bad people are very uncommon. Yeah. Like I would think irrationality is not as common as people think. Yeah. Or want to think like you're yeah. saying, Oh, they're just all idiots. Well, there's many more reasons people do what seems like something stupid is actually perfectly rational. It's just, you don't like it just because you don't like it. Doesn't mean it wasn't rational or maybe it wasn't rational from your perspective, but they have every good reason to do what they did. I actually thought about this in relation to myself. Um, what you're saying, because I, I remember you saying this, you were saying we were talking about this and that's what I concluded. Like most, like there's a lot of mistakes in thinking, but um, I was thinking about myself and like, there is some element of truth in the fact that if you can't, like, if you're not thinking very well now and you're doing all these mixed things, so some are bad, at least for me, there's definitely an element of, I can see how in the past, like the decision not to focus and instead drift onto other things and not try to learn and uh, figure things out in a conceptual way leads to this kind of like more issues later on in the way you, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, in the way you do things too. And so you might say, oh, someone's making an error and they are, but I can see how it may be caused by the fact that, you know, they just kind of gave up on thinking about things or like chose not to focus a lot of the time. Um, so it's tricky in that sense, but the only, the only relevant part of this I would say is to apply to, to myself because it's too hard. Like if you can't evaluate yourself properly, then I don't see how you're going to evaluate anyone else. So, I agree. uh, all right, well, let's go. That's the, uh, my random questions for you, which took up quite a bit of time. Maybe we can finish up with just, uh, um, some, questions from my document sure all right see it we can turn off our video if you want yeah all right so this i'm going to rephrase this because we spent a while discussing at what point blah 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 and i already know this is it's not about at what point it's about an extent at, to what extent have you achieved reason purpose and self-esteem as values because we we did discuss that earlier this was an old question um and so what I'm going to ask actually on this, uh, on this thing, like to what extent have you achieved reason, purpose and self-esteem is, do you think there's a limit on these things? Like, is there a limit or what does it mean to have a limit on self-esteem or like a limit on achieving reason? Is there such a thing or can you keep achieving so. more of it? It's just a constant process. That's how yeah. I would phrase it. Not that yeah. it's an amount you attain. It's just, you're always doing it. Okay. Maybe there's a limit to the amount, but you have to maintain it. It doesn't stay. You don't just get the number and it stays. You've got to cultivate in the sense that you keep fertilizing it, keep feeding it, keep developing it. It doesn't stop. Otherwise, it rots and just disintegrates. Okay, but the, the alternative isn't maintained at some point or rots, right? Like if, if it's it's not like a one or zero. And so if there is a, from previous discussions we've had on this, I understood self-esteem, for example, part of that to be to, I think it was phrased as something like to earn the, um, 
to earn the right to love your life or so or to make a life to make yourself to make yourself worthy of living and so we sort of discussed how that would be an emotional evaluation and so then my question is more of like let's say you are working you work to achieve your reason your purpose your self-esteem and it's an ongoing process and you keep doing that that i understand but if you keep on working at it does it get bigger and bigger like is it more and more pleasurable for example or is there more and more reason or is there more and more self-esteem i don't that, know to an infinite extent okay maybe purpose can grow but yeah. i guess that's more the range like it always it's wide it can get wide over time right okay uh and then he talks about so in this section he was talking about uh, he talks about this kind of man who's achieved his values, but not his existential values, just that these philosophical values that are their precondition. Um, he has achieved not success, but the ability to succeed, the right relationship to reality. And then he talks about something called an emotional leitmotif mo of leitmotif. such a person. Late, late what? It's a good theme. Late, late motif. I don't know. Uh, There's probably a different Australian pronunciation. It's a weird. <laughs> it's a All weird right. Word. All right. So, um, so he talks about this being a metaphysical pleasure and it's like this, this idea of, you know, it's a positively toned context. So pain doesn't blunt you. Oh, it does blunt pain more. And then it intensifies pleasure. But my question is how can you like, to me, it seems like you can't disconnect that from existential. There's, there's some element of you can have existential, like if you have, you need to have some existential success. Otherwise, I don't see how you can just have this leap motif of um, um. I think it's just saying that you may have not attained that end goal. You might not have attained yet that goal of the value, say the value was like become getting an Oscar, just, just became a random thing. I'm sure you could think of a better one, but imagine that was your a value you wanted to achieve. Yeah. And you were just an actor so you imagine you're 20 years old and you just haven't attained it yet. You, you know, it might take years or decades to even get there, but you know, eventually you will. You, but you would definitely say you didn't achieve that value yet. But we could say, maybe, say by the time he's 30, achieve like a, a philosophical value that to live by reason, purpose, and self-esteem, you could achieve that as a philosophical value as in like, you want to live in this way. You want to have these things and you can live life in such a way that those are maintained. You could say you've achieved them in the sense of you live by them, realize them and are able to make use of them. It just doesn't mean you've reached that point where the, those existential values, those, I think by existential value, he means more particular things that you want to attain that, that ultimate purpose or or the state central purpose, attaining that, that's different, that's separate. But not having that, we could still have that, the kind of success of living a life of reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, I guess there's got to be some existential element. You're just saying that if you've set a specific purpose and you haven't got there yet, but you think it is possible because you have evidence, existential evidence to suggest yeah. that you're, you've made some progress towards that goal, then this med that's what the metaphysical pleasure is. So it's not like you can have this if you're in a concentration camp, for example. Right, you couldn't. Yeah. Or a um, dictatorship according to Rand, like it would literally be impossible because the nature of man is denied completely right. that you can right. even use reason purpose or self-esteem it's complete horror and there's nothing so does that mean all of history has been dictatorship so does that mean all of history mankind has been well has been they may have frustrated your attempts but the complete elimination 
a reason for his self-esteem. I'm not sure if yeah. that's always been present. I mean, it's occurred throughout history. Like, I could think of the Spanish literally just decimating people just because they were there. I mean, not even because the, the people like attacked them. Like, they just slaughtered people because they wanted to, or maybe the Spanish Inquisition. Like, you could just throw in jail and tortured. There's no reason. You're given no possible way to escape. You're just tortured until okay. you die. Things right. like that. But if you think about maybe ancient Rome, where sure there's a lot of things that are unfair, I'm sure, and improper laws, but in general, people are able to like have markets, trade things, develop ideas, write things down. So it wasn't frustrated in the same way that you might if the government was going around slaughtering everyone. There's a difference of degree there. It's not yeah. completely eliminated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most of history wasn't ancient Rome or Greece. Right. So, so you could say there's a lot of things about people that really even impossible to attain those basic values. Like maybe like um, the Mongols or something that probably was not a way to live by reason, purpose, and self esteem in an integrated, successful way that you really need trade and rational interaction and no initiation of force to even interact in this way. Yeah. Um, do you, when they say metaphysical pain, what, what does that mean? Is that some, I couldn't quite understand what, what's, what's met, metaphysical add to it. Like the immoral man by contrast suffers metaphysical pain that is injury, anxiety, conflict, self-doubt inherent in being an adversary of reality. So I would say all the Mongols and the Genghis Khans and the, um, yeah. the whoever else, I don't know, the Hitlers. Yeah. I would argue that based on this section, it's a bit poetic here, but metaphysically here seems to be like the very nature of their existence is pain. Like it's pure pain. Like their only okay. existence is defined by their pain or suffering. Right. There's nothing else to their life. Right. It's a claim that without reason, purpose, and self-esteem, your life becomes a metaphysically painful. Like existence itself is an anxiety, doubt, whatever else it says there. Right. And even if you didn't analyze like 